I've dedicated myself to cataloging and rating every mystery box story. The mystery box story is a genre of fiction, and this is its basic definition. For more in-depth explanation, check the title card. This episode, I'm looking at a mystery box book series, The Last Dragon Chronicles by Crystal Lacey. So, uh, this is definitely the most obscure thing I've ever covered on this channel before. The Last Dragon Chronicles is a British fantasy book series, and it consists of seven books published between 2001 and 2012. Making a video on this might be ill-advised. It sold reasonably well, but it's no Harry Potter. I don't know if anybody out there even cares about it. And on top of that, it's a book, so I don't know if there are a lot of visuals I can show. As I'm writing the script, I have no idea how to make a video like this look good. But whatever, that's future editing me's job to figure out. I want to give it a shot though, because these books were really important to my childhood, and they were maybe my first. In For this video, I'm going to mix up the structure a bit. Since I can't assume anybody watching has read these books, I'll summarize the whole series first, and then get into the analysis. Here we go. The first book, The Fire Within, introduces us to our main character, David Rain. He's an average college student who rents a room in the Pennykittle house with a woman named Liz Pennykittle and her tween daughter Lucy, and their cat Bonington. Liz makes and sells clay dragons for a living. There are a ton of them around the house, and for some reason, Liz and Lucy talk about them like they're alive. And sometimes, David notices that they seem alive. They make noises and move locations and apparently send visions to David's head. On his first day there, Liz makes David a dragon named Gadzooks, who has a notepad and a pencil in his hand. But most of the plot of this first book isn't about dragons, really. It's about squirrels. Lucy and David begin an adventure to save Conker, a one-eyed squirrel who lives in their yard, from their cranky neighbor Mr. Bacon. While this is going on, David decides to write a book about all the squirrels in the neighborhood, which he calls Snigger and the Nut Beast. Snigger's another squirrel. As he's writing, something weird starts to happen. Whenever he gets stuck, he sees an image of Gadzooks in his mind, and Gadzooks writes a few words on his notepad to point him in the right direction. This happens a few times, and then eventually, David's book and the real-life events start to match each other eerily well. David writes details into the story that he couldn't possibly have known about. There's one chapter where he literally writes events as they happen in the next room. So yeah, something about these clay dragons are magical. But no specifics yet. We get some insight as to how they were made when Liz tells David the story of Gawain, the last dragon. Gawain was friends with a human girl named Guinevere. Gawain was dying, and Guinevere, distraught, went to ask a creepy old witch lady named Gwilana for advice. Gwilana told her that when Gawain died, he would cry a fire tear that contains the dragon's Uma, or life force. She told Guinevere to catch it, which she did. In the climax of the novel, David has a fight with Gadzooks because he refuses to believe the dragons are alive, so Gadzooks dies. Realizing the mistake he made, David catches Gadzooks' fire tear and restores him. Now, David mostly believes that the dragons really are alive, and he deduces that the penny kettles are descended from Guinevere, and the clay dragons are made with little pieces of Gawain's fire tier. Pretty simple so far, right? The plot in the beginning of the series is manageable enough, but it won't take long to get really complicated. The second book is Ice Fire, and the book wastes no time adding ice related lore to the story. Lucy makes her first dragon, a wishing dragon named Gareth. She wishes for snow, and it snows. David wishes that he, quote, knew the secret of Gawain's fire tier, and nothing happens, at first. David finds out that Liz keeps a snowball in her freezer that she's had since she was a kid. Weird. David's new professor, Dr. Bergstrom, assigns him an essay on dragons, and gives him a narwhal horn that apparently shows you your destiny. When David touches it, he sees Gadzooks write the word Laurel, 
which his classmate and love interest Xana tells him is the name of a polar bear. Pretty soon we meet the antagonist of this book. A creepy old lady shows up at the house calling herself Auntie Gwyneth. But it doesn't take long for us to learn that she's really Gwilana, the witch from Liz's story. Eavesdropping on a conversation between her and Liz, David learns, Gwilana was summoned by David's wish, polar bears are the guardians of the tear in some way, and Xana is a sibyl with literal witch powers, although she doesn't know it. When Xana visited the Pennycattle house, she touched a clay dragon egg, and apparently that brought the egg to life, and it will hatch soon. Gwilana's plan is to steal the dragon creature that hatches from the egg, and to find the location of Gawain's fire tier, both for unspecified reasons. While trying to find a way to defeat her, David and Xana confront Dr. Bergstrom and find out that he is Laurel the Polar Bear. Well, to be more specific, he's a Nanukapik, a higher being who can shift between polar bear and human form, and who is charged with protecting Gawain's tier. Also, while this is going on, David goes to a publisher to get Snigger and the Nut Beast published. He ends up walking away with a two-book deal, for Snigger and a to-be-written book about polar bears. Gwilana has taken over the Penny Kettle House and sets about enacting her evil plan. But long story short, the good guys stop her. During their fight, Gwilana scratches Xana and leaves three gashes on her arm, the implications of which are unclear. The egg hatches a baby half-dragon creature, which Xana adopts and names Grockle, and who then turns into stone because he doesn't have a proper dragon spark. Bummer. Xana also takes custody of Gretel, Gwilana's clay dragon who switched sides during the climax. Finally, David goes to Dr. Bergstrom and gets a more complete version of Gawain and Guinevere's story from him. When Guinevere caught Gawain's fire tear, the power was too much for her to hold. It created a child, Gwendolyn, who was part her, part Gawain, with some of the power of a dragon. The fire tear fell into the ground and reshaped the planet to create the Arctic Ice Cap. A bear named Thorin rescued Guinevere and Gwendolyn and became the first polar bear. And now we know what became of the fire tear. It resides in the Arctic, as in it's the entire Arctic. That snowball Liz had, that's from the Arctic and it contains a tiny spark of the fire tier. The third book, Firestar, starts with a few different perspectives. David and Xana on their arctic expedition, Liz, Lucy, and all the clay dragons still at home, and a polar bear named Ingvar traveling across the ice to find David. While he's up there, David starts writing his novel about polar bears called White Fire. Soon it becomes increasingly clear that the story he's writing matches up with the story of Ingvar the bear. This confirms what was hinted at when he wrote Snigger. Somehow, David's stories are perfect transcriptions of events that happen in real life, even if they're hundreds of miles away. Also, Gwilana's back. Great. In the first chapter, she appears to Ingvar in the form of a raven to start him on his journey. Then later, she shows up at the Penny Kettle House and kidnaps Lucy. Her goal is to try to revive Gawain for some reason. Something weird is going on with Xana. Remember the three scratches on her arm? It's called the Mark of Umara, and it apparently unlocked witch powers inside of her. David and Xana have an encounter with Ingvar, who almost kills them, before he's captured by the researchers. David goes back to America. Then while the people in charge of the expedition prepare to release Ingvar back to the wild, something weird happens. Xana, acting on some deeper instinct, puts an artifact called the Tooth of Ragnar into Ingvar's mouth, and they both disappear. Gareth has disappeared too. I'm not sure. Another dimension, I guess? Where he talks to a creature who calls itself Thane. Throughout the second half of the book, David and the others get cryptic instructions from Greth, who is presumably passing on messages from Fane. He tells David to make a clay dragon, for example, which he does, a healing dragon named Golly Gosh. Gareth also gives us our first straight answer to what dragons are. He tells Bergstrom that dragons are from an invisible universe governed by dark matter. That's an exact quote, by the way. A race called the Fane travel to Earth via a portal created by the Fire Star, which is a little star in the sky to raise dragons. The creature who made the earth as we know it is a dragon-like being called Godith. Get it? God-ith? But the portal closed itself and dragons were trapped on earth. Now the stars have aligned once again and the portal is set to reopen. Some of the clay dragons find a way to revive Grockle using Bonnington saliva. I didn't mention this before, but in the last book, Bonnington drank some of the melted fire to your snowball. But as soon as he wakes up, Grockle jumps out a window and flies away. Bummer. Through this, we also learn about how Liz and Lucy were born from clay eggs like Grockle was. So were all of their ancestors, going all the way back to Gwendolyn. All of the Pennykettles are created as part human, part clay, part dragon slash fire tier, 
part Gulana magic, and part of whoever their spouse is. Liz opens up about her ex and Lucy's sort of father, Arthur Merriman. They were madly in love, but Gulana chased him away and he disappeared. Then, out of the blue, the Fane contacts David telepathically. It tells him that Arthur is living in a monastery, and that he and David are connected somehow. The book switches point of view to Arthur, living in the monastery under the name of Brother Vincent. Just like David, he's been writing stories he thinks are fiction, but are actually true. The story of David, the Penny Kittles, and Dragons. The story of the last two and a half books we've just read. And this is where Grockle went. He and Arthur are hanging out and learning about each other. But the other monks think Grockle is a demon, so they lock them both up. The monks think Arthur is insane, but one of them, Brother Bernard, is slowly seduced by the whole dragon thing. He writes a letter to David asking for help. But something gets there before David. Remember Fane, that creature Gareth was hanging out with? It's evil. It travels to the monastery to free Grockle, so that Grockle will gather all the dragons in one place, so that they can all be destroyed at once. Because this Fane wants to wipe out all dragons on Earth, for some reason. It attacks the monastery, frees Grockle, and cripples Arthur in the process. The book ends with a big battle in the Arctic. The Firestar opens up, and the Fane battles David, the dragons, Lucy, Xana, and the polar bears. In short, Grockle flies through the portal, and David defeats the Fane, but in the process, he takes a spear through the chest and dies. In the epilogue, we learn that Xana is pregnant with David's child. You might be noticing that there are some obvious gaps in my summary. Stuff that makes you go, wait, why did that happen? Some of those things have explanations that come later in the series, but just as many are just plain unclear. I didn't explain them because I don't know why they happened. And these kinds of moments only become more common as the series goes on. Buckle up because things are about to go way off the rails. For the next book, The Fire Eternal, we skip ahead five years. David has been dead for a while, but White Fire has become a massive bestseller and made him super famous. Liz, Lucy, and Xana do their best to adjust. Xana is raising her and David's daughter, Alexa. Lucy, meanwhile, refuses to believe that David is dead, and is doing everything she can to bring him back. A reporter named Tam Farrell comes to town, asking questions about David and what happened to him. No one trusts him at first, but he proves himself to be not a jerk after a while. He tells us something really strange. There's no record of David's existence before he moved in with Pennykettles. Some polar bears go on a quest to revive Gulana, led by Ingvar, who seems different than he was in the last book. He's smarter, more sure of himself. When the group finds Gulana, Ingvar transforms himself into David. Yep, David's alive. Shocker. But this David is nothing like the person we're used to. He's otherworldly, like he's more than human. It's unsettling. Alexa keeps drawing a dragon named Galant, which was the last thing Gadzooks wrote on his pad before David disappeared. She also draws a mammoth, which then appears to David and co. in the Arctic, so she's rocking some serious magic powers. Through David and Gulana's conversations, we learn some more about the Fane. They came from another dimension called Chimera to breed dragons on Earth. Some of them fused with humans in a process called commingling. But this process changed both human and Fane. It made humans more intelligent and power-hungry, kicking off human history as we know it. And some of the Fane became corrupted by humans, becoming an evil offshoot known as the Ix. The evil Fane from the last book was a member of the Ix. After a civil war, most of both sides left Earth. But now, the Ix are back with a plan to take over the world and make anti-dragons called Darklings made out of dark fire. Tam and Lucy go to the address David mailed his tenant application from to find where he lived before moving there, only to find that it doesn't exist. We also learn that the name Galant is David, but what that means is unclear. And then a member of the Ix kidnaps them. They force Lucy to sculpt their Darkling dragon along with a spear made of obsidian. In the climax, the Ix and the Darkling attack. In short, the bad guys are defeated. Liz is stabbed with the obsidian spear, but Gwilana heals her, with the help of Gwilon, one of the clay dragons, crying his fire tear. And after it's all over, David appears one more time, and we get a sort of confirmation that he is a member of the Fane. Oh, I have a headache. Darkfire begins, thank God, with a diary entry from Lucy that summarizes the most important parts of the lore so far. It was a useful check-in for me to make sure I had everything straight in my summary. Anyway, David's back for real this time. He's still all Fane-y and otherworldly, and he's prepping for war against the Ix. Meanwhile, Xana meets with Gulana. Willana is building a beacon to call the Fane and make a deal with them. Either they grant her higher magic powers, or she hands over a substance made from inverting Willan's fire tier, called Darkfire, to the Ix. 
and if the Ix get Dark Fire, they can destroy the world. But it doesn't go as planned, and she accidentally revives the Darkling that Lucy made a few books ago. The Darkling starts sending agents to attack and corrupt other Pennykittle dragons to make more Darklings. And old friends of the Pennykittles call in to report that the clay dragons they bought are acting strange. David and company try to use a bit of Dark Fire to heal some of the dragons, but instead, the Dark Fire goes into Liz and makes her sick. Which is especially bad because she's pregnant. Oops. But turns out the spirit of her unborn baby named Joseph migrated out of her body to take over the body of Gwilon. Also, Alexa, who is half vain and half human, is growing wings out of her back. So that's neat. The Penny Kettles track down a friend of Arthur's named Rupert Steiner, who was visited by Gadzooks one night. Gadzooks left a message that says Scruffinbury. Lucy and Tam Farrell go there to investigate. And they find a dragon lying dormant underground, guarded by a unicorn. It's prophesized that a red-haired maiden will awaken it. In other words, Lucy. This dragon is Gawain, mother of the other Gawain, and spelled differently. Lucy goes underground, touches the dragon, and awakens her. There's a big battle between the good guys and the darklings. It seems to be going well at first. Gwilan slash Joseph helps purify some of the darkness, and Gwilana shows back up to help Elizabeth give birth to Joseph. But then things take a turn for the worse. The dark fire inside Elizabeth kills Gwilana, and Gawain sacrifices herself to kill the Ix. In the process, the Unicorn absorbs a bunch of Dark Fire and falls into the Earth's core, corrupting the Fire Eternal and creating an unstoppable force of darkness that envelops the Earth. Before it takes over though, Gadzooks writes the word sometimes on his pad. Fire World takes a pretty significant turn away from the usual path in this series. Instead of taking place on Earth, the whole book takes place in an alternate reality called Copernica. It's a high-tech fantasy world where people have the power of the fame. They can manifest things with their minds and communicate through telepathy. All the characters in this book are altered versions of the previous characters, usually with different names. Dr. Stromberg, Eliza, Rosanna, and instead of dragons, there are firebirds. The main character is a kid named David, who has begun to manifest abilities more powerful than anyone else in the world. We follow David and the other characters doing their thing for a while, before we get some hints as to what this world really is. He and Rosanna read about dragons from the Book of Agawin, which is an obvious anagram for Gawain. Rosa learns the word sometimes in dragon tongue, which by the way, is the mark of Umara. She says that it's a powerful word, that you could imagine a whole universe by saying it. Partway through the book, the Ix come through some kind of interdimensional gateway to talk to Harlan, who is the stand-in for Arthur, and Gadzooks comes with them. They explain, kind of, that Copernica is a dimension created by the Fane as a sort of backup world for humans, in case Earth ever fell apart. Although there are a bunch of other moments throughout the book that imply Copernica is also Earth's future, I don't know what to make of that. They also say that the battle for Earth that we saw at the end of the past book is suspended in time by David and Gadzooks, using the nexus between all three worlds. The Ix merge with Gwyneth, this world's version of Gulana, and she causes all kinds of mischief but the Ix tell her about the other version of her that died on Earth, and when she is defeated, she uses her dying breath to revive her other self with magic. In the final chapters, David finds a tapestry depicting the battle, and he learns that he has to send his help to Earth, because unlike the other characters who are separate beings from their counterparts, David is somehow one being spread across all three worlds. In the final pages, the tapestry begins to change because of Willana's revival. The final book, The Fire Ascending, mostly takes place in the distant past, narrated by a boy named Agawin. At first it's not clear whether this is Ancient Earth, Ancient Copernica, or both. The world resembles the stories of Gawain and Guinevere, with the dragons and fane running around. But the tapestry makes an appearance, the world Cat is spelled K-A-A-T, which is how the Copernicans spell it, and of course there's Agawin himself, whose book is in Copernica. Agawin merges with a Fane and fights with the leader of the Ix and the big bad of the book, Voss. Agawin kills a dragon named Galen to prevent Voss from using his Uma to become more powerful. In the middle of all this, Agawin thinks to himself that sometimes he will be called Agawin, and sometimes he will be called, and then he gets interrupted before he can finish. This is a classic mystery box move, cutting off a key lore reveal like that. Anyway, Agawin wins the fight, but then gets thrown into the near future and is saved by a woman named Guinevere. A couple things here. Guinevere has a dragon egg, which hatches into baby Gawain. Willana is here, and we learn her origins. During the battle from before, a sibyl named Hilda gave birth to an evil darkness baby on Voss's orders. 
But the baby disappeared during the battle and grew up to be Quilana. Go figure. There's an eagle named Gideon who mingles with Gawain's Uma to become the first firebird. And oh yeah, Guinevere isn't just some random girl. She was crafted by Gwilana with magic using the Uma of her adopted mother Grella. Then David and Rosa show up, having traveled from Copernica, confirming that this is taking place on Earth. And for some reason, David tells Agawin that they are from, quote, what you might call the future, even though that's clearly not true and just muddies the lore of Copernica way more than necessary. But whatever. Agawin and Gwilana have an argument that goes south, and Agawin dies. But then some firebirds visit him, and tell him that they have a message from Joseph Henry. That's Elizabeth's unborn son from a few books ago, remember? They tell him that he has to die and be reborn as Alexa. So that's the name he was going to say before. Sometimes Agawin, sometimes Alexa. So let's talk about Joseph Henry. What he is or how he works, I don't know. But he is the orchestrator of everything that happens in this last book. He and Gadzooks worked together to pause the world at the end of Darkfire, and he is the one who brought David and Rosa to Earth by sending them the Firestar. He takes Agawin slash Alexa on a time-traveling journey to watch the birth of Guinevere. Unbeknownst to her, Alexa's angelic presence stopped Guinevere from becoming an evil construct and instead went out to be a force for good. The final chunk of the book takes place in an alternate timeline following that battle, where Voss and the Ix have almost entirely taken over, creating an army of Darklings. But they need Alexa to complete their conquest. David and the others fight in the final battle. It goes poorly for a while, but then Joseph Henry and Guilana come together to defeat Voss and- You know what, hold on, I should stop for a minute and tell you this. You might have noticed that at the end of almost every book, I summarize it just like, there was a battle, and the good guys win, with no further details. That's because I don't have a clue how or why anything happens in any of these battles. There's always a scene where, like, the good guy and the bad guy talk for a few pages, and then the good guy starts babbling about fame and energy in the universe or something, and the bad guy goes, oh no, and loses. I wish I were exaggerating, but I read the climactic scene of this last book multiple times, line by line, and I don't have a clue what Gawain and Joseph do to make Voss and the Darklings die. But that's what happens. Also, Gulvana says that creatures called the Guardians have come down to reset time. So they do. I swear to god, I have no idea what happens in these freaking books. Then the book throws one final curveball. We get an epilogue that apparently takes place in the reset timeline. In this timeline, everything we just read exists as the best-selling series of books by David Merriman. The whole Pennycandle family exists in this world, except without all their magic, and David is the adopted son of Elizabeth and Arthur Merriman. A grown-up Alexa gives a TV interview about how these books came to be. How many years ago, Liz died, giving birth to a stillborn son named Joseph Henry. This tragedy inspired David to write these books, about fictionalized versions of his family members bringing into it his mother's love of dragons and Arthur's eccentric beliefs about how the universe works. It might appear at first that all the dragons and faint stuff is purely fictional in this universe, but in the final pages, David makes mental contact with Gadzooks, showing that there is still some magic left. <sighs> okay, that about wraps it up. I gotta say, I liked these books a lot more when I was a kid. I was more willing to go along with all the weirdness. Now when I read these, I just get frustrated with how hard it is to understand what the heck I'm reading. By the time I got to the end, I felt like my head was going to explode keeping track of all these plot threads. I'm sure that I made lots of mistakes in my summary, whether it's misinterpreting something or leaving out a key detail. But this was genuinely the best I could do. Isn't this supposed to be a series for kids? Why am I having so much trouble with it? I even caved about the companion book, Rain and Fire which is a sort of making of story about how Chris DeLacy came up with all this, but it didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. Okay, let's see how it follows the 10 rules of mystery box stories. First, yes, it opens up with a pretty clear mystery. The first book has clay dragons which may or may not be alive, and Liz and Lucy acting weird and secretive about them. Then very quickly, the story opens up into many, many other mysteries, which I don't need to or want to go over again. They are all interconnected through the lore of dragons and fame, and they're definitely known to the audience. The series is long, alright. It's seven books, and those seven books are pretty hefty. But beyond being long, this mystery box is big. It has the largest and most complicated plot of any mystery box story I know. A very distant second is the TV show Dark on Netflix, which I'll make a video on sometime soon. The story and the mysteries in these books are so massive that you have to binge read them or risk forgetting all the critical plot details in between installments. It's exhausting. It does a pretty good job of pacing reveals. There's never a point where the books run out of questions to answer. 
and the ending of each book generally wraps up any smaller questions raised in that book. I wouldn't say the answers it gives are always clear, or good, but I don't have any specific complaints about the series' pacing. Is it clear that the mysteries are diegetic? No, absolutely not. This is especially true regarding the epilogue, which calls into question whether anything in the entire series happened at all. It's my interpretation that, yes, they did, but I can't say that I'm 100% sure. And throughout the story, there are tons of moments that meddle the lore and make it hard to tell what's real and what's not. What about mystery box tropes? Is there a secret organization controlling everything from behind the scenes? Well, organization is the wrong word for them, but the Fane fit into this pretty nicely. The series has lots of non-linear storytelling and time travel, especially in the last book. There's no literal box to open. As for the character who knows all the secrets but won't tell you, there's a ton of those. In book one, it's Liz. In book two, it's Dr. Bergstrom. There's also Guilana, Joseph Henry, and in the second half of the entire series, David. How's the ending? Does it wrap up enough? I suppose technically it answers the biggest questions from early in the series, like where dragons came from and what the Fane are, but I finished the series feeling unsatisfied, like there were huge chunks missing from my understanding of the plot to feel like anything was neatly wrapped up. And besides that, I can think of at least a dozen unresolved plot threads off the top of my head that went nowhere. And that's because none of the answers in the later books were planned from the beginning. Chris Delacy is very open about the fact that he made up everything as he went along, which explains why the series developed into such an incomprehensible mess. And finally, do the mysteries tie into the characters and help you get invested in them? Yeah, that's a hard no. This bloated disaster of a plot actively hinders your ability to care about the characters. In particular, David, who starts out as a likable if generic protagonist but later on becomes what amounts to an exposition machine, with all character traits stripped away. And in general, it's hard to care about anything any character says or does because there's no way to guess what random direction the story will jerk them next. No action has any weight, because the lore of the story is so much bigger than any of the people in it, and nobody seems to have any control over what happens. Oh god, do I hate these books? I think I hate these books. When I stumbled onto the series as a kid, I had never read anything like this before. I was so fascinated by the massive and sprawling mythos that kept getting bigger, and I had so much fun trying to keep track of it all. Now though, I know there are other stories out there that pull off this kind of thing so much better. After doing a few of these mystery box videos, I've come to the conclusion that the worst kind of mystery box story is the one that checks off the first six criteria and not the last four. These are the stories that promise a really cool and interesting mystery that will evolve over time, and instead falls apart into a jumble of nonsensical plots that don't mean anything at all. The Last Dragon Chronicles seems like it exists only to break the brains of any ten-year-old who happens to stumble across it. It's a terrible mystery box and a terrible story. Except I don't know if I should be this harsh. Because this was one of my most important and memorable experiences with a book, maybe ever. And it was because of those poorly executed mystery box elements. These books have stuck in my mind for a decade plus because of how mysterious and convoluted it was. I'm reminded of the David Lynch quote about closure. i just put the quote up right here. Closure. I keep hearing that word. It's the theater of the absurd. Everybody knows that on television they'll see the end of the story in the last 15 minutes of the thing. It's like a drug. As soon as the show has a sense of closure, it gives you an excuse to forget that you've seen the damn thing. This nonsensical plot is what made the series memorable to me as a kid. And that has to count for something. Even if it didn't really hold up revisiting it as an adult. The Last Dragon Chronicles gets a final mystery box rating of 6 out of 10.